Life in a small town is supposed to be predictable. That's the beauty of it. Every day, the same faces, the same places, the same routine. Everything makes sense. Until one night, a school librarian returns home as usual, has a bite to eat, and then, without warning, vanishes. Suddenly, nothing makes sense. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Police have been called to the home of school librarian Sylvia Thompson. The school principal says she didn't show up for work this morning. She didn't call in sick either. My concern started about five minutes after the time that she usually arrived. Sylvia normally greets the children first thing every morning. She's never late. The fact that she wouldn't be there without letting us know was very uncharacteristic. Uh, it was like clockwork. Uh, the buses would roll in at 20 to 9. She was there. And uh, I can't remember any day that she missed this duty. The principal says he called Sylvia repeatedly, but she didn't answer. He decided to go round to her house. When he got no answer there, his next call was to the police. The local constable asks detectives Jim Miller and Sean Evans to investigate. Inside the house, police find Sylvia's coat, boots, and purse. Why would she leave home without them? The rest of the house was impeccably clean and tidy. There was a gas fireplace that was on uh, with the flame burning. There was uh, one Lazy Boy recliner, beside which was a small side table. On that side table was a tray uh, some dishes that had remnants of a meal. The principal says it's not like Sylvia to leave behind dirty dishes or forget to turn off her fireplace. The detectives ask if Sylvia seemed upset about anything recently. Did she ever mention going away? There were no thoughts of her being depressed or, or of such, especially since she just celebrated her 50th birthday. She was in a very cheerful mood. So there was no indication to us that there was anything where she would perhaps have left for any kind of reason. The principal then notices something missing. Sylvia had two recliners in her living room, not just one. The detectives are concerned. If you decide to disappear, why would you take a recliner with you? News of Sylvia's disappearance has spread. Neighbors come forward, anxious to help police. She was last seen by a neighbor going into her home 7, 7.30 in the evening, and then the next morning she's nowhere to be found. The community was quite upset about somebody had gone missing out of their home. One of there's uh, some wild person on the loose abducting people. Police decide Sylvia's disappearance merits a full investigation. She's declared a missing person. The school community, of course, became quite concerned. And there was a lot of concern about the children being traumatized by this. Children just loved to be with her. She was very caring, and she listened very carefully to children. She was a very professional teacher, and it showed. I mean, it showed in everybody that we interviewed. Uh, just 
how much of an impact she had on so many people's lives. Rumors start to circulate. Some people are even saying Sylvia's been killed. There was tips from uh, people that they said that uh, she was dumped on along the roadside on certain roads, uh, that she was dumped in a pond uh, kind of southwest of town. Townspeople fear the worst. With police help, they form a search party and comb the area. I don't think any of us believed that we would find a body. We believed we would find some kind of clue, however trivial, that may, may have be some of assistance. Of course, in the back of your mind, you always harbor that intrepidation. If Sylvia was ever in the vicinity, all signs of her have vanished. The search is called off. One searcher then comes forward with new information. He tells police he's the stepson of Sylvia's boarder. His stepmother has been away on holiday for several weeks. The evening before Sylvia disappeared, he went by her house to see if his stepmother had returned. Sylvia said she hadn't. The young man tells police Sylvia then invited him in for a visit, but she asked him to leave at eight. She said she was expecting someone. Police want to know who that someone might be. Police conduct a complete forensic examination of Sylvia's house. We had a forensic identification team uh, come in looking for any kind of evidence that may assist us with the disappearance of the victim or any suspects that may have been in the house. The identification team finds 12 shoe prints. Police eliminate the prints of anyone who entered the house after Sylvia disappeared. They expect to find Sylvia's shoe prints and those of her unknown visitor. That's not what happens. Their prints have vanished. But the forensic examination isn't over. I sprayed the floor with luminol, and luminol is a blood enhancement chemical that is used in order to locate blood. This chemical basically glows in the dark. The officer discovers a blood smear under the couch. Two blood profiles later emerge. They determined uh, through examination at the Center of Forensic Sciences was a combination of uh, male and female blood. The female blood sample belongs to Sylvia Thompson. The source of the male blood is unknown. Police are now certain Sylvia is the victim of a violent attack. The question is, by whom? In a small town, a school librarian has vanished. Physical evidence suggests foul play, but no body has been found. There was a candlelight vigil, just to give some relief to people, because as time went on, despair set in, and prayer did help. From the perspective of, of fear, uh, people not knowing uh, you know, if there was some person loose in the community that was breaking into homes, uh, certainly affected the, the neighborhood she lived in. And everybody in, in the small community was certainly had, had a lot of concern, asking us if they should be afraid for their lives. Police receive hundreds of tips. Every one of them needs to be chased down. And we had a number of phone calls from uh, people that lived within the immediate area and about observations they made of the victim's residence on the 5th of January, 1998. Neighbors report seeing a pickup truck in front of Sylvia's house at midnight. Although the, the descriptors of the truck did somewhat vary, they were fairly consistent in that it was a small pickup truck with some distinctive marks on it. Investigators realize they've already spoken with the truck's owner. He is Martin Edelenboss, the last person to see Sylvia Thompson before she disappeared. Midnight sightings of his truck in front of her house would conflict with his statement that he left at 8 p.m. Police run a check on Martin. 
He's done time for sexual assault and is out on parole. When I had my discussion with the parole officer, she had nothing but good things to say about uh, this individual, that he had uh, uh, been a model parolee. There had never been an issue as far as uh, a breach of conditions. She had no concerns about him being uh, in the public. Police learn Martin Edelenboss is a heavy equipment operator at a nearby landfill site. A better place to hide incriminating evidence would be hard to find. Police need to know more. We decided the following morning that we would start to send some investigators down there um, to start to do some interviews. Investigators ask what happened here on January 6th, the day of Sylvia Thompson's disappearance. A driver remembers seeing Martin early that morning when the driver came on shift. Investigators ask him if he saw Martin dump any garbage that morning. The driver says he didn't see Martin dump anything. It's a busy sight. Police conclude that if Martin dumped something, someone here would have seen him. Investigators then learn a nearby power plant is protected by security cameras. All trucks going in and out of the landfill site are monitored. We uh, obtained copies of those uh, videotapes and uh, found a vehicle coming in around four, quarter to four in the morning. The tape shows someone dumping something, but the images aren't clear. The pickup truck looks a lot like Martin's. Investigators returned to the landfill site. They need to know Martin's exact movements that morning. On that particular day, he was not supposed to start work. Uh, until 7 a.m. Uh, he, in fact, had arrived early. We started to learn of some very peculiar behavior that he had exhibited at the landfill site on the morning, the 6th of January. The driver now tells police that when he arrived at the site that morning with a load of garbage, Martin insisted it be dumped in a specific spot. Martin then went round to the rear of the truck to watch the load being dumped. This was a very significant safety violation within the tipping area. So this was something that uh, he should not have been doing. Was there something at the landfill site that Martin wanted to hide? Police believe there was. I had a pretty good gut feeling that he was in there disposing of the chair or the body or both. If Martin used his truck to transport Sylvia's body to the dump, a forensic examination will prove it. Police seize the vehicle. An identification officer searches Martin's truck for physical evidence. Blood causes luminol to glow, but so does rust. The truck bed is so rusted out, there's no way to distinguish one from the other. Sylvia may have been at the truck, but the investigators can't prove it. To make the case, they've got to find her body. They mount a massive search. There was thousands and thousands of tons of garbage dumped uh, a day in that landfill site. And um, it was just uh, a huge task even to, to, to try and take it on. We taped off an area probably about the size uh, of two football fields where we were going to commence our, our search. And uh, I wanted to go down uh, 20 feet. We searched there on seven days a week through all kinds of weather. The stench from the, from the landfill site was horrendous. We found numerous rose-colored chairs. You know, I didn't believe there was that many uh, rose-colored chairs around. On day 36 of the search, investigators find the remnants of one more chair. There was a label stapled to the wood on the chair that had the victim's name on it. That even gave me a stronger indication then that, that, uh, that the victim was probably in there somewhere as well. need to keep close tabs on their prime suspect. 
But Martin Edelenboss has left town. Police learn he's in Niagara Falls, where he's just been arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct at a strip club. By leaving his hometown, Martin has violated the terms of his parole. He's picked up just 100 yards from the US border. We believe that he might be trying to maybe run across the border and disappear. Police don't have enough evidence to hold Martin, but they warn him that if he breaks parole again, he'll be taken into custody. Two months after Sylvia was declared missing, the search area has been excavated to a depth of 20 feet. I made a decision to uh, go back another uh, 50 feet and go down another 10 feet. I think I was not very popular with the searchers at the time, but they knew it had to be done. I left the landfill site probably about 2 o'clock that afternoon, and uh, at about five minutes after 4, I got a call from the supervisor at the landfill site saying, you better come down here right away. We found something you'll be interested in. I went in and, and looked at what they had found. The body was partially involved in a piece of carpet. We believed it was the person that we were looking for. After a two month long search, investigators have discovered what they believe to be the body of missing librarian Sylvia Thompson. The remains are sent to pathologist Martin Queen. A direct comparison of the pre-mortem dental x-rays and the post-mortem dental x-rays will lead to a definitive identification of the victim. In the small town, the discovery of Sylvia's body hits hard. We, in a lot of ways, of course, had been expecting the worst. Yeah, that's only natural after so much time. But that didn't lessen the impact and the, the grief that was shared. Investigators believe Martin Edelin Boss is Sylvia's killer, but they have no physical evidence connecting him to the crime. They decide to test his truck a second time. To find blood that has not been contaminated by rust, they take the truck apart. Hidden in the wheel well, having entered through a crack in the truck bed, the examiner finds blood. DNA tests reveal the blood matches that of Sylvia Thompson. We determined that, that we had sufficient evidence to, to arrest Mr. Edelin Boss for, for first degree murder. And uh, I attended the scene and placed the accused under arrest. Less than 72 hours into their investigation, Martin Edelin Boss introduced himself to police as a concerned friend. Now, police know exactly how he killed Sylvia Thompson. What we learned was that uh, early on at work, the accused was involved in some consumption of alcohol. He picked up a carpet at the landfill site. Not too drunk to drive not too drunk to find his way to Sylvia's house. He knew her border was away. That meant Sylvia would be alone. He knew she would remember him from her party. Upon arriving at the home, he um, knocked on the door. He was invited into the residence, and very shortly thereafter, there was uh, a physical assault. She was strangled with significant force and was then raped. Why the accused did what he did, 
You know, the only thing I, I can say on that is he acknowledged that he went to the home that night specifically to have intercourse with the victim, and he was fully prepared to use force. The accused remained within the victim's home for several hours, during which time he had uh, undertaken some steps to clean up. But Martin missed a spot, leaving a trace of his DNA behind. believe that he had took the body to the Keel Valley landfill site at 4 o'clock in the morning, dumped it in there. He got rid of the blood-spattered recliner at the same time. When the first driver arrived at 6 that morning, Martin directed him over to Sylvia's body. Martin believed he'd made Sylvia vanish, but he was wrong. She is still remembered. Children just loved her, and there were hugs often given to her. She was a gifted teacher. Every time one of her students reads a story, Sylvia lives on. For the crime of first-degree murder, Martin Edlenboss is currently serving 25 years with no possibility of parole. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. 